1960 Olympics, which is when periodization had been introduced in between the two, the previous, the 56 and the 60 Olympics was when it was introduced. So 60, they did really well. They came top of the medal tables. 1961, a planning unit was established within the Soviet Union to make periodization available to the entire Eastern Bloc. So they were going to shove it everywhere. Everybody's going to get hold of Matt Reeves' periodization. On top of that, in 65, it then became available to East Germany, which is obviously separate from West Germany. In 68, the East Germans beat West Germany at the Olympics. And it's important to to understand that East Germany had a third of the population of West Germany. So it was like, clearly they're doing something. We're not going to talk about the fact that East Germany had one of the largest state-sponsored drug regimens for their athletes. That's not the point. Clearly it was the periodization that was going on. Welcome back, team. Another week, um, I believe, if I'm looking at the right calendar it's right around new year's is this when are we we're doing this intro yeah in advance so happy new year happy new year's eve i think is when this will come out we've got a repeat guest this week one of uh one of our personal favorites uh alex who are we talking to we have keichi anyadike danes back for round two to discuss the second installment of his planned three-part research series looking into the divide between human performance research and education and the reality of actual coaching practice. KT doesn't just focus on the theoretical. He's also passionate about his own training and coaching, especially in weightlifting. He is a doctoral student at the German Sport University Cologne, where he has been looking at various aspects of athlete preparation and how coaches perceive various theories, concepts, and strongly held beliefs that exist in the training literature. His doctoral research is being supervised and helped by friend of the pod, John Kiley from the University of Limerick and Lars Donath from German Sport University, Cologne. On this particular episode, we will be focusing on the periodization conversation of his three-part series. And as we did with the first one, obviously we'll link the paper in the show notes. The title of this one is Coach's Perceptions of Common Planning Concepts Within Training Theory, an International survey. So similar to his first paper, he canvassed over a hundred coaches of all levels of experience, pretty senior and well-educated folks, and, and essentially asked them questions on whether or not they, one, implemented periodization, but then two, more broadly, how they approached training. So if you've listened to the first episode we did with KG, one of the things that I think really stood out was that here we have a a self-proclaimed researcher, academic, but also a coach and athlete himself who is really, I think, doing a good job connecting the dots, so to speak, between well, well thought out research and actual practical application. And then certainly conversation starter, case in point, this is the second time he's come on. So, And I think Perhaps most interesting about this one, there's lots of debate, and we've talked about this before on the podcast about periodization versus planning and that whole space. And like, should everybody be periodizing? Is everybody inherently periodizing? Whatever you want to approach this from. You're all wrong. I think he did a good job with this survey of setting up both the superficial level question of asking a bunch of high level coaches, do you use periodization with your athletes? And then following that up with a bunch of questions about the core concepts that are, at least theoretically in the literature, fundamental to periodization. And you see a very different answer between whether you ask a coach, do you use periodization? And when you ask a coach, do you agree with the following fundamental concepts within periodization? And we'll we'll dive into that in the episode. Yeah. And before we let you go and get into the normal advertisements and, and the episode itself, we just really quickly wanted to plug a new resource that we're dropping on the website. We're kind of planning out content and thinking about the new year. And one of the things that we want to do based on a lot of feedback, I think we've gotten from, from service members is open up an opportunity for folks to submit. I'm I'm calling it kind of stuff that stuff you want to learn stuff that you want us to either research and talk about ourselves uh, or bring in experts to have conversations about. So I'm, I mean, I'm thinking things like how to how to train for a two mile, how to like what is cardio, what is resistance training, really basic, simple stuff. But things that I think a lot of people 
want to hear more about that quite frankly sometimes we we miss or or overlook because you know we're we're kind of trying to cover as many bases as we can with this platform so head over to the website when you get a chance uh, if you're interested submit something and we will start to consolidate and collect and plan accordingly Hey guys, before we kick this episode off, just wanted to give a quick plug to the two options that we have for folks interested in training with us. We have the team-based long and strong program. And then if you are interested in a more engaging, intensive, uh, more tailored option, we offer one-on-one coaching as well. And you can find both of those on the training tab of our website, mopsandmoes.com. And if it's the team training you're interested, click that link and you will find a one-week free trial. So again, if any of the things that we talk about on this podcast are interesting to you as far as training goes, head to the website like Alex just mentioned, select that training tab and follow the instructions from there. Enjoy the episode. Well, let's start with this then before we go go off on tangents as we are wont to do. Walk us through this paper. Version version 2.0 of of (laughs) Keiichi, the second coming. (laughs) <laughs> wow you're <laughs> definitely gonna get some hate from people i can imagine on the religious right in america for saying that oh. um <laughs> uh okay so yeah so essentially for me this is how should i say this is the hot topic in some ways i guess from what we just said um but not in other ways but for me what set the scene really was the fact that Everybody seems to be talking about periodization, but not everybody seems to be talking about the same thing. Certain people say that periodization is literally the savior of sports, and that's how we've get gotten the best performance in all of human history. But not everybody says that periodization is the same thing. And I think, yeah. One of the, there are a few things that realized I, need, I, I wanted to do this. One is the quote um, that's in the paper that this is kind of, we're talking about uh, by Tudor Bumper, considered one of the fathers, probably people consider him like the second father after Matt Biev, who's like the founding father of periodization, um, who was interviewed and at one point said, you know, if we don't have periodization, we have chaos, which to me is like, the craziest most outlandish statement to make so that was that um on top of the fact that you know periodization is said all the time it's talked about in the in fact to be honest it's impossible to find a training study that you know is uh, dealing with any significant length of time it's impossible to find a training study that doesn't actually use the term periodization in its title or in its like methodology description and i'm like so we are then accepting that there is only periodization, um, which I find really, really weird um, because I just, I find it hard to believe that there's only one way of planning training. Uh, and then that was the other thing. Um, there seemed to be a really big, uh, between some camps, this idea that, you know, it was periodization is the big picture and then you have things subsumed within that. So like programming, for example. And then other people are like, well, hold on a second. Like, no, periodization is a approach, is an approach to the planning slash management of the training process. But it is that. It is a approach. Um, mm-hmm. There are a multitude of approaches. Uh, and I started to realize, as anybody does when you read out, when you start reading through this stuff without thinking about it, there starts to be seen, I guess what some people might call like a bait and switch. And I don't want to use that too harshly because that makes it sound like people are purposefully doing this. Some might be, I don't believe everybody was doing that, where planning and periodization just became synonymous at some point. And, and then you have like, you know, in, in which case the Tudor bumper quote makes all the sense in the world because... If planning and periodization becomes synonymous, then it really would be quote unquote chaos because you would just be doing nothing. You would just be like randomly just choosing stuff like let's roll the dice or whatever and just like it will just pick something up randomly. Um, so I think it was based on that. And having spent, having talked to enough coaches, um, that sounds like a lot, not that many, but coaches <laughs> who were, who would, 
people who were coaches themselves, but then also managed other coaches. So they had been able to have lots of conversations themselves um, that, yeah, it just didn't seem like everybody was doing periodization. And I guess this also is borne out by the fact that I wanted periodization to work when I was younger. Mm-hmm. The idea was like, oh, this is good. This is it. This this is how we, we just need to like fix a few things. And periodization is what makes athletes great. And it's like this great plan, this great process. But the more I read about it, the more there are lots of little things that just didn't make sense. Like, how did you determine how much volume load that you needed in different phases and all this kind of stuff and the exercise choices. And the more you go into it, the more it becomes like everything has to be perfect. Mm -hmm. But if everything has to be perfect, then nothing can ever go wrong. In which case you have a big problem because I've never seen anybody be able to do a training plan as an athlete and enact it to the T exactly the way that was envisaged at the very beginning. So I know Drew wants to set the stage historically for like where we were before we arrived at periodization. I will say, Mm -hmm. and I know a lot of the audience is probably wondering as they're listening to this, we are eventually going to try and define periodization, (laughs) but that's a, that's a bigger rabbit hole than you might expect it to be. And before I hand it off to Drew, I do just want to, I have a couple books in front of me that I pulled off my shelf before we started chatting. And since you mentioned Bampa a bunch of times, I'm going to read one line from Bampa's book. I'm sure we'll do more in a second, but the line is, The terms planning, programming, and periodization are often used as if they were synonymous, but they are not. Good for him. We will will come back to that soon. (laughs) What a cliffhanger. That is straight out of Bamba. (laughs) Well, so where I I want to start with this, and I forget the exact date that you mentioned, but with with Matt Vive, basically, Mm -hmm. we'll call it creating, quote unquote, periodization. What was happening before that? I mean, how were people training? Was it was it random? Was it unplanned? Was it like what was what was there before there was this sort of perceived structure? Do we know? Yeah, I mean, oh, definitely. I think we we have lots of different writings. I I guess so. The first thing I would say is that no idea is created in a vacuum, mm-hmm. and so what I mean by that is it's not just like one day bomb. Uh, uh, Matt V was like. <gasps> Ding, 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 light bulb <laughs> idea. Let me net, note this down and, and do this um, because it definitely wasn't like that. And as I'm sure he was, you know, quite an interesting guy, relatively switched on, that would be way too amazing to credit anybody to have some ability to do that. Um, so, you know, as I say, he's still on the shoulders of giants. He built his stuff based on what had already been done. And it depends whose stuff you read because there are different accounts. And so I'm about to give one account that was translated by a guy named Kruger. He's a German who had, I believe, had read Soviet accounts at the time. And obviously there was a link at the time between Germany. And uh, so they have stuff in German as well. But I don't want to say this is the official thing, but I have seen similar stories um, of this, of how Matt Vive got to periodization. But essentially, it was done through the analysis of athletes, large numbers of athletes who competed at this, in this for the Soviet Union, and looking at similarities, etc., between who was successful and who peaked on time, and who weren't successful and who didn't peak on time. Because I think that's the first crucial thing to understand is that, um, according to this, Matt V. Singh was for one purpose and one purpose only, really which was to get a surefire way or as sure far away as possible uh, athletes to peak on specific dates. So it was about making sure they got their best performance when you need it, which that's a whole different discussion about that because it's a it's kind of interesting notion of how you knew if they did it on that date because you can only compare it to other dates. You can't really, because nobody you do this, you know, do the Olympics, have them compete at the Olympics one week later, maybe test them again and see if they did it. Nobody really does that. So you can only compare it to other competitions in the year, for example. But anyway, that was the point to to get them to peak on time because of some perceived belief that they weren't, not everybody was performing to their best standard when necessary. Um, So because he was essentially retrospectively analyzing coaches, journals and athletes journals, None of this stuff was highly originally his. He was looking at lots of coaches' ideas. And then he was taking existing famous coaches' ideas 
and trying to package them all together in a way of kind of like explaining what was happening. So like one person he was super influenced by is a, I think, I want to say he's Finnish or Norwegian, a coach called uh, Lori Piccola, uh, who is a coach of a very famous runner called Pavo Nurmi. Mm-hmm. On something he has like he had like 21 world records or some crazy like, yeah, something I know crazy that, like that across different distances because they had way I think they my understanding they had way more distances mm. they competed at. Um like all what I would call odd distances, so not necessarily just the Olympic kind of ones. And he some of them, I think there was some story about him doing like two of them in a day kind of situation. Um so you know, so he was reading literature on how he arranged his stuff and you know, like he divided. Um, Pavo Nurmi's training into four periods. There was like a preparation period, a spring period, a summer period, and a period of recuperation. So that's obviously a year at that point. Um, and then each of these training periods were divided into shorter cycles. So just by describing that, we've already got like, I mean, people would say straight away, he's doing periodization. We just talked about periods of training because like some people believe that that's all that it takes to be periodization. So, you know, he drew on a lot of that stuff. So there are people doing similar things, not exactly the same things, but then there are other people doing other kinds of things. And I guess the last thing I'd say on this point is that throughout history, there have been lots of different things. The Greeks getting ready for the Olympic Games. They had what they called the perennial, uh, I think it was. It's like a four-day cycle of training. And then you literally just repeat the four periods of training over four-day periods over and over and over again. So there have been lots of different things. And if your thing is that periodization is quite literally just the dividing of time into individual periods, then yes, everybody has done periodization from the day dot because nobody thinks you can do the exact same thing every single day f- forever. You have to have some kind of variation. I wouldn't say nobody. I would say there's a fair chunk of the military <laughs> that thinks you could probably do the exact same thing <laughs> over and over and, you know. Anyway. That's fair. I haven't read the military, so I mean, <laughs> Neither here maybe there. there is. They they know something <laughs> that I don't. Um, but it's all to say, I guess, is that you know people are doing lots of different things, and I think the the problem that we have in the literature at the moment is that people like to retrospectively analyze things based on our current knowledge, um, and from a socio cultural and historical vantage point, that is, a, for me at least, that's a real big no no to try and use your current ways of knowing things and understanding the world around you and try and extrapolate that on top of how they knew the world and explain, oh, they did this because, you know, they knew that you need to do periods in this kind of way because of some physiological kind of stuff. Like, well, possibly not because their understanding in like Greco-Roman times of physiology was very different Mm -hmm. um, from ours. And our understanding of physiology is actually fairly recent in comparison for humans doing sports and competitiveness. So yeah so one thing i want to do to set up where we're going here this will be nerdy again i feel like you've got like six books in front of you right now i only have two books in front of me (laughs) i have other stuff in the notes but to there is a chapter titled periodization in the nsca's essentials textbook and that's where a lot Mm -hmm. of people go off to get their certifications and things like that it's essential it's all the essential and things and so i'm going to read two super brief expert like excerpts from that some of Mm -hmm. it follows what Ketchy was already saying. It adds a little bit of a layer to it. And this is going to set up kind of a conversation that we're going to have that you cite in your paper about conflicting definitions and how many definitions there are out there in the field. (laughs) So to quote the textbook, periodization is often attributed to Medvedev, who uh, proposed the basic theories that underpin periodization in the 60s. But though he is often considered the father of periodization, several other individuals were exploring the concept at the same time including Laszlo Nadori, Tudor Bampa, Yuri Verkoshansky, and later on American sports scientists, Michael Stone, Harold O'Brien, and John Garhammer adapted the concepts of early periodization theorists with special application to strength and power athletes. Ultimately, periodization is a theoretical and practical construct that allows for the systematic, sequential, and integrative programming of training interventions into mutually dependent periods of time in order to induce specific physiological adaptations that underpin performance outcomes. We're going to come back to a few of the key terms in there because they're relevant, the mutually Mm -hmm. dependent and the physiological outcomes and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, But I wanted to pull a piece from the next paragraph as well, where it says, 
At the center of this process is the ability to manage the adaptive response, handle accumulated fatigue, and capitalize on the after effects established from previous training factors encountered. The strength of a periodized training plan lies in its ability to sequence and structure the training interventions in order to manage all of these factors and peak performance at appropriate time points. Ultimately, peak performance can be optimized only for short periods of time, and the average time it can be maintained is inversely related to the average intensity of the training plan. From there, they dive into general adaptation syndrome and Hanselli. Oh, God. I, I know we're about to dive into this. Some of the mm. some of the things that appear in certain definitions but don't appear in other definitions is whether each period is mutually dependent, like whether it relies mm. on adaptations produced from previous periods, and so whether sequencing is important. Mm -hmm. The peaking thing appears in a lot of early definitions mm. and then disappears from other definitions. So it's is it periodization regardless of whether there's an intended peaking phase and things mm -hmm. like that? That's another question. I think if I have my notes correct from your paper, you found 80 distinct definitions in the literature. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So what what are we working with here as far as a functional definition? Well, first of all, I'd just like to say that one of those names of people you who was referenced in that Yuri Verkoshansky is probably mm -hmm. rolling in his grave. The fact that anybody <laughs> would suggest that he was working on periodization. And I just say that quickly for the people out there who are interested in this stuff. Uh, so Yuri Verkoshansky is among people who are into this stuff, quite a famous uh, and yeah, infamous person, I say, a uh, sports scientist from the Soviet Union, who was the guy who some say invented, let's say, popularized plyometrics. So he was the kind of the father, quote unquote, of depth jumps. Like so, that was his work. So he he legitimately really was like a sports scientist and an ex athlete and coach. And I say that because he actually wrote a paper, scathing paper, called The End of Periodization. So I really just don't think the guy who's calling for the end of periodization was probably working. In fact, he was deeply, deeply against periodization. So I just find it ironic that they would use him as an, ex I'll, as an example. I'll sling one out here. I think the Verkashansky working definition of the term periodization was long-term cyclic structuring of training and practice to maximize performance to coincide with important competitions. Mm -hmm. I'm not mistaken. Yeah. That was the definition he that, was working with when he was talking about periodization. Yeah. Oh, in that case, yeah. But I mean, he was deeply critical of Matt Viev stuff. Not of Matt Viev per se, or the idea of what Matt Viev was trying to do. But he, his main thing was that Matt Viev, um, based, and then we'll get not too much of a tangent. Then we'll get back to what you're asking. Matt Viev based uh, a lot of his stuff on uh, pedagogy, so like um, ideas around coaching about how people develop movement systems, that kind of stuff. So his thing was um, around what they call form. So getting into uh, sporting form. And Verkashansky was like, uh, no, we need to do this all based upon physiology and biology. And so a lot of that physiology stuff is really heavily comes, not only, but Verkashansky was seriously into that. Um, despite that now being part of the Western stuff, um, like my understanding and reading of it is Matt Viev didn't have Hans Selye's stuff in his original conception and physiology slash biology was second string um, to pedagogical stuff. But that's digressing <laughs> into your original question, which was about the definitions. So the AG definitions comes from a paper called uh, by a authors called uh, lead authors the guy i think i'm saying is right kataoka um so kataoka at al and they found over 80 um possibly even 100 uh definitions for periodization and they th that's only starting in i want to say like 82 is the first one that they get which i think was a stone and um somebody else paper um so obviously at that point periodization is been around for like I think at that point 20 years um, since it was first popularized after the 1960 Olympics so in terms of having a cohesive definition they created one in that paper Kato et al created a, a definition um, based on essentially reviewing all these definitions they tried to pull the different features that like came up routinely over and over again and so I guess like a, a version of I guess a systematic analysis of these things and then put them all together the key factors appear and a couple of things that stand out is one it is heavily based within physiology which is kind of ironic as i said because that wasn't the leading basis of 
periodization when uh, Matt V put it Matt V put it forward. But yeah, so I mean, it's this is the definition that they gave. That they came up with is periodization divides a training plan into discrete cycles, phases, or blocks that focus on developing specific physiological adaptations uh, to your muscle hypertrophy, strength, et cetera. Over time, the training program will typically progress from general to specific adaptations with the intention of bringing peak performance at competition time. So that's the kind of definition. And I use that along with a Stone definition from a periodization paper that Stone et al. had published, I think, in like 2021 or 2022. Um, which was had similar, it, so they had a few extra bits in there um, about the codependent nature, essentially, of these blocks. But the interesting thing is that, you know, Matt, uh, Matt Vive didn't actually really give a definition. Um, like, periodization, as was well explained by um, uh, Verkashansky in a piece that he wrote, periodization was a how. So in the famous book that Matt Vive wrote that lots of people in the West have access to, he describes the problem. He describes what he thinks are the fundamental underpinnings of how training works. So, you know, how you have to train certain things or whatever. He, he explains those. Uh, and then periodization was merely an answer of how to arrange all of that. So there is no definition like I just read that I've ever found that Matt Vive did. Um, because periodization was mere, was a tool, I guess. Whereas we now talk about periodization like it's a theoretical kind of thing versus just any other training system. Um, going back to what you asked, Drew, any other training system of which there are many. Um, so if we called like, you know, I think it would have been really interesting because if we had instead of called um, periodization, periodization, if Matt Vive had called it the Matt Vive training system, you know, I'm not sure if we'd have been that hung up on it as we currently are, because, you know, you have like, I think his name is Arthur Lydiard, who is the famous running coach out of, out of New Zealand. I just obviously um, talked previously about Laurie Piccola, who's a famous, uh, I think he's Finnish coach. They all had their own training systems, you know, and that's what people went to. And that's what we read about. Like when we read books about these coaches, we read about their training. And then they'll be influenced by the coaches, obviously, but then they'll also be influenced by their own experiences as they go along in time. And they develop their own understanding about the training process, which might be based on similar things, but why they're doing it was probably going to be heavily influenced by the experiences that they have. Um, but somehow, uh, periodization took on a, became a beast and took on a mind of its own, really, and became the way. Not sure if that really answered answer your question or not. Alex. <laughs> no, I mean, we'll we'll probably keep circling that one because it's a giant <laughs> semantic black hole. Yes. But what I what I will say is I had not personally read the end of periodization article you mentioned by Verkashansky. Yeah. So I, I pulled it up as you were talking mm -hmm. and skimmed it briefly. And man, this thing is savage. <laughs> oh, he's brutal. I he... will include it in the show notes for people. It's only yeah. seven pages long. It's super. It was one I was gonna I was one I was gonna send you guys. I mean, the thing is you probably need to read it a couple of times, I think, because it's translated by a guy, um, mm -hmm. although Verkashansky signs off on it. But some of the terminology is not necessarily matching up. I mean, there's a, there's a whole set of issues with that, which is why there's also issues with some of Matt Vieira's work, because some of the terminology that they used in the Soviet, when translated, doesn't necessarily match up. Like instead of eccentric, they use the term sure. yielding as an example. So you have to sometimes like catch yourself and like, oh, what exactly is he saying here? But yeah, he was pretty savage on it. And he, I mean, I have his book, Verkashansky's book, and there's an entire appendix. And when I say appendix, it's more like 12 pages about his, what he did for in the Soviet Union. And about half of it, he just rips to pieces periodization, calling it old hat and being like, we need a shift. I'll pull out some quick excerpts for people just to get the idea of the tone of this paper. <laughs> <laughs> um, but like one line at the beginning says many experts today consider that the theory of periodization does not meet the requirements of contemporary sport and can have a negative influence on performance development. Wait, say that when was, when was this published? Give the date for this was uh, published 19, September, 1998. Okay. So oh, it's, been yeah, around, yeah, it's been around for a while. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's like oh, a yeah. translation and republication thing. Um, mm -hmm. there's some, some section headers to give you an idea. Um, one section is titled disregard of new biological understandings. One section is titled <laughs> Missing Legalities in Training Concepts. That's a reference to what Matveyev called yeah. le biological legalities, which yeah. have been savagely torn apart since then. 
Yeah. There's a section titled Lack of Scientism. There's a section titled Scientism. Lack of Reality. Yeah. Uh, there's a section titled <laughs> Arbitrary Division of Training Processes. A section titled Adaptation Principles Are Ignored. And then it ends with a summary section that points out four cardinal errors that have robbed the concept of periodization of training from its theoretical and practical. Wait, but, and, and just to circle back on that, though, you, he was one of those cited in the essentials textbook. Yes, as correct. Being, okay. As being yes. a father of periodization. Yep. Yes. Okay. Just exactly. wanted to hammer that point home. But I, I thought it was interesting <laughs> that you mentioned, and this has always been interesting to me because you, you always hear about periodization concepts and, and, you know, books such as that from the Soviet perspective, generally around, um, Olympic type sports and or weightlifting. But then you mentioned Lydiard and you mentioned some of these endurance coaches. And I've always found it fascinating looking at their stuff because typically they're giving a coach's perspective of having worked with one singular athlete for one particular Olympic cycle or maybe several cycles. But it's it's cool to see their perspective on coaching because they get so invested in that one particular athlete versus taking more of a meta view i think of like prilipin's chart for example which so many coaches hold as absolute law because oh they you know they they, been there done that (laughs) yeah no same thousands of weightlifters and blah blah blah. it's like yeah yeah, cool great but like the fact that this one coach worked with this one athlete and deduced this one thing which you could argue is a system because the other thing that's interesting about that and I, i was thinking about this as you were talking about periodization and it's to me it's a little bit like capital c crossfit where Mm -hmm. people have now taken like i could prescribe to you any collection of different modalities and somebody's going to say that's crossfit it's like well why is that crossfit well because crossfit includes blah 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 blah. Mm -hmm. and i think you look at some of these coaches and and these training manuals from these athletes usually in the endurance space and that the periodization fanboys will tell you that they're using periodization when really what they've done is just retroactively decided that Oh, well, in hindsight, clearly there was planning. Clearly there were phases. Clearly blah, 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 blah. Ipso facto, it must be periodization versus recognizing like, well, no, this was just the system that they arrived at because it's what worked best for that athlete. So I don't know where I'm going with that. It's just an interesting observation. No, I agree. I mean, so an article that I had ready for this, really interesting. So this is like from 1986. And it's the same guy writes two articles for this is like the early NSCA's journal, um, obviously at 1986. And it's called Foundations of Training Periodization. There's a part one and part two. And this is, I'm about to read from this part two, which I think is really interesting. So he's talking about how, you know, periodization is being developed and it's gaining popularity. Uh, And he says, at this point, it is necessary to open a parenthesis. And he goes, many athletes and coaches think that periodization with its stern formulation doesn't take care of the normal physical and emotional fluctuations of the athlete. Thus, the so-called instinctive training is more suitable. Mm. So, Mm. you know, so, and I don't think that's entirely surprising. Um, I think the idea, there's an idea presented that like everybody in the USSR and, you know, all that were using periodization. um, And that's, you know, clearly the, if they were all using it and their athletes were getting good results, you know, correlation causation, it's why they are getting good results because of the periodization. But, you know, going back to that article that I mentioned previously by a guy called Kruger, he highlights some really important facts that contextualize possibly why periodization was so popular. The first is that it was the middle of the cold war <laughs> and it's the ussr and there was america one kind of speculative bit is that the ussr used a thing called state planning which was essentially planning from above uh, structuring everything uh, versus decentralizing everything uh and when you look at periodization uh, periodization does the exact same thing it's highly structured from above because you plan in periodization from above Mm-hmm. versus having what you might call like an emergent kind of thing where you start below and you see what happens and you plan as you go along. Here, you start from above and you plan all the way out. Similar to how the economy was done, and if people want to look at that, it's called state planning. They had five-year plans um, of which they had what how much of each thing had to be produced within the Soviet Union. It's kind of like periodization with four-year plans for the Olympic cycle. So there's 
that was part of fed into like the war of when they became successful, it was periodization. Look at periodization. It looks like socialist state planning. Boom, we're beating the Americans in capitalism. That's one potential potential entry point. The other bit is in 1961, so the year after uh, the 1960 Olympics, which is when periodization had been introduced in between the two, the previous, the 56 and the 60 Olympics was when it was introduced. So 60, they did really well. They came top of the medal tables. 1961, a planning unit was established within the Soviet Union to make periodization available to the entire Eastern Bloc. So they were going to shove it everywhere. Everybody's going to get hold of Matt Reeves' periodization. On top of that, in 65, it then became available to East Germany, which is obviously separate from West Germany. In 68, the East Germans beat West Germany at the Olympics. And it's important to, mem- to understand that East Germany had a third of the population of West Germany. So it was like, Clearly, they're doing something. We're not going to talk about the fact that East Germany had one of the largest state-sponsored drug regimens for their athletes. <laughs> That's not the point. Clearly, it was the periodization that was going on. So West Germany got a hold of that. They got a translation of it. And West Germany then decided that they were going to set up a funding procedure for their um, sporting bodies. But there were strings attached. Only sports federations who proved they were using periodization for their annual plans would get access to the funding. If you weren't using periodization, you didn't get funding, for example, for training camps. So now, not only is it incentivized in the USSR and the entire Eastern Bloc, then East Germany, then West Germany, then you have it being picked up by the likes of people in the NSCA and in the early 80s, I think it's 79, the first article appears um, with a guy called Garhammer, 81, I think it is, uh, Mike Stone and a few others write the first periodization, I believe, article in the what is now the Journal of Strength and Conditioning Research. And then you move on and now every single SNC accrediting body has it in their course literature, which means that you have to answer, you have to learn about it, answer questions on it. And if you're a university degree program that wants to cross a credit with one of these big bodies like the NSCA, the UKSCA, the ASCA, you also will have to teach it because their students will have to be shown that they can do it to get the accreditation. So it just snowballs. And before you know it, now it's everywhere. Can we, because I mean, I know the, I mean, that was a lot, so I apologize for that. (laughs) No, I think it's imp- I think it's important to lay out because people, like you just mentioned, you, a lot of the um, <clears throat> we'll politely call them the the detractors, so to speak, that slide into Alex's DMs on the Instagram. I think come from that entrenched system where, for lack of being presented with literally any other option, you just assume that that that's how you do it. Like how else how else would you do it? Which then transitions kind of nicely to I think what you set out to do in this second paper and where I want to go next, which is the survey setup that you did similar to your first one, where we first had you on here now asking questions to coaches about periodization and planning and just kind of their approach to structuring training. Can you give us sort of an overview and we'll include the paper in the show notes, but an overview of some of the findings from, from that paper. And then we'll dive into some of them specifically. Yeah. um, So I think, some surprising, I guess, I guess some were, I mean, I guess that most, a lot of them were unsurprising in terms of that they were the responses, but in terms of what I might consider, that sounds like a logical approach. Some of them were less surprising. I think the first thing is that in line with a lot of other papers, uh, when presented uh, with a choice of, you know, do you describe your planning approach as periodization or not so do you know is what you do periodization the vast majority said that they use periodization so like 71 percent of the people did and i think it's really interesting i think it's really important to first of all contextualize that is uh, the question was asking about their own personal assessment of what they do that is not being judged by anything any other answers that is literally how do they self-describe what they do which is really interesting then when you start to read their responses Mm -hmm. to other things Mm -hmm. aspects of the planning process 
so that that's a really important one because lots of other studies will show that but more recently studies that have actually gave coaches an option to choose between a description of periodization and what you might call like a more dynamic adaptable approach um in the couple of studies that's been done so far far fewer people choose periodization than an alternative approach but that's because periodization is spelt out like what is involved in periodization and so that's a bit of a problem which is why but i thought it was interesting to ask just to see if it trends with what other people are saying anyway so that that was a kind of interesting one i thought anyway <laughs> <laughs> and then the other one is whether they saw perceived difference, which goes back to what we're saying, whether they saw perceived difference between planning and periodization. And I think that's kind of important because as we just said, there's a lot of literature where they combine the two and it becomes really, really murky about what is planning, what's periodization, is there a difference? If so, where does one begin and so on? And again, a little bit less than the previous one, but 61% agreed that they did see a difference, which is important even more so than moving on because some of those people are the periodization people. So they say they're doing periodization, they can see a difference in what they're doing, but then the follow-up questions makes it for, I thought, kind of interesting reading. So uh, I think the, the key things when it, when it comes to periodization is, so we had some basic stuff on planning and that was like kind of what you expected, like, you know, you evaluate your athletes' needs for the season. If you didn't do that, I've, I mean, if nobody said they disagree, and if somebody did, I'd be like immediately trying to contact them and be like, how <laughs> do you do that? I don't understand. But then, you know, you start to ask some questions that are, you know, related to periodization and things get a bit skewed to begin with. So it's like I divide the season into distinct manageable periods of time. And there's like 2% more than the people who said they do periodization. So it's like 73% people said that they divide the season into distinct manageable periods of time. That's kind of interesting because some people would say that's like a hallmark of periodization, but clearly for some people, although it's a hallmark, it isn't like the defining bit of periodization. I'm which, gonna jump in here just to underline yeah. a point you make because I think it's important. There's a lot of disagreement around what the specific definition of periodization is, but I think we can mostly agree that it would make sense that periodization involves dividing training into periods. It's literally yeah. what the word is. Yeah. And your research found that 17% of self-identified periodization users don't divide yeah. training into periods. <laughs> yeah. That's not a huge number, but it's a significant number. <laughs> I, I mean, and that's where you like, you have to like interpret. Okay. So is that potentially like a mis? A weird interpretation of what was being asked of them mm -hmm. or because you know because it, it's an interesting kind of thing because you'd think that i mean i wouldn't necessarily describe what i do as periodization when i used to coach uh, for the little bit of time that i did but at the same time i would obviously divide things into periods and i'm kind of not sure how you don't but that's that's okay that's you know everybody interprets these things differently so anyway so i, I thought that was so we got to the first one clearly and you know that's kind of tracking. So a lot of people are dividing things into periods. Um, nothing, you know, out of the norm about that. There was interesting things about goal setting, where not everybody did defined and detailed goals for each of those periods. However, many there may be, maybe there are two, three, four, five, but each of the periods that they just broke time into didn't get a goal. That's a bit weird given you know, what was read out about, you know, each one having, you know, a physiological thing. But I know some detractors might said, well, you did say defined and detailed goals. It's like, yeah, uh, I did say defined and detailed goals because what I, and this is, will come up in the last bit of the section of this paper. If you don't have defined and detailed goals, then I don't know how you know when you've hit your goals or not which leads to a big question that I've all, always had for periodization is without defined and detailed goals, are you just training for allotted periods of time? So let's go with this really standard, I have a 12 week training plan, I divide it into three, four week blocks, whatever, okay? So you have three training periods and they equally last four weeks. It's like, why do they last four weeks? you just training because that was a great mathematical rounding and, or how much time you decide to give them. Like 
is it just based on time? Because I don't, unless you have a defined and detailed goal, I could own a harp on, but if you don't have a defined detailed goal, I don't know when you know that you got to the end of the period of time, did, do you need to keep training? Should you stop training earlier? If there is no goal, then I don't know how you know when to stop. That will kind of come up in a later bit of the paper because that's linked to the kind of interdependent nature of periodization. I know Drew has a question coming for you, but I do want to highlight on the point you just made, you talked about like how much time do you spend in different phases and how do you break up those periods? And, and one of the findings in the survey that stood out to me, going back to that NSCA definition I mentioned before of Mm. mutually dependent periods of time to induce specific physiological adaptations that underpin performance outcomes, only a third agreed with that. And it was relatively similar between self-identified periodization users and non-periodization users. So even among the coaches that said they are periodization users, more people disagreed with that concept than agreed with it. Yeah. Well, I just, I made a, I made a face as you were talking, because I think the point, the whole like training for a goal and having discrete phases thing, I think is interesting because we talked about the emergent style that, you know, sort of bottoms up approach. Mm -hmm. And and I think about where I pulled a lot of my, because that's what I like to do. I mean, I I think I'm I'm probably pretty evangelistic about that. I think that that's the right way to do things, but I pull a lot of my background from that, from Bondarchuk, who was a a throws coach, a hammer throwing coach. Mm -hmm. And I remember trying to investigate that exact question because, you know, if, if, how do you know you've achieved a goal if you haven't set a goal? Because my, mm-hmm. my follow on to that would be, well, is it an arbitrary goal that you have set that you are then achieving to pat yourself on the back as a coach? Or is this like a relevant performance metric? And with Bondarchuk, I know, you know, like what he did was he'd have athletes repeat a very discrete number yeah. of sessions and track the throwing distance. And once that throwing distance sort of peaked and then started to fall off, then, then at yeah. that point you would say, okay, we have achieved that goal. Now we will shift gears and go into a different direction, you know, whatever. And then in hindsight, you can sort of break training down into phases as a byproduct of the athlete having reached that, you know, adaptation potential, whatever you want to call it. Because for me, it's, you know, and and I don't know where this puts me in in relation to the guys that answered the survey, but it's like some athletes might peak in four weeks. Some athletes might peak in eight weeks. Some athletes might peak in two weeks. And I think if you, if you come at the training, I suppose, puzzle from this idea that you need to have these discrete phases, you do run the risk. And this is why we keep having this conversation because you do run the risk of arbitrarily cutting off a training prescription at four weeks or at six weeks. And you lose some of the potential that that athlete might had, might have had they done that for three, four, five more exposures. I think that's why it's relevant. And I realize I'm like rambling and going on a complete Mm. tangent here, but it's interesting to be asked, like, do you have a goal? Well, yes, but it might not just arbitrarily be that you double your back squat in eight weeks. It might be that we take this adaptation to its logical endpoint based on the metrics we've created in the plan. And then we switch gears, but that's, that's me done. (laughs) I I kind of have a question based on that for both of you guys, because both of you have gone deeper into this than I have. Correct me if I'm wrong. The original quote unquote, periodization research was done based on looking at the training logs and diaries of Soviet (laughs) athletes preparing for the Olympics. And like Drew said, even if you don't approach it in a periodized way, it might look periodized after the fact when you switched phases based on the results of something. And isn't that, isn't that like a textbook description of the post hoc fallacy? Like, isn't that exactly what it is where like things look a certain way in retrospect? That doesn't mean they were always inevitably going to be that way. Well, I think it's, I think it's an attempt as with anything. And I mean, you know, we could almost talk about H2F in the military, what they're trying to do here, but like you take an idea that worked for say two athletes and you want to industrialize it and make it applicable to everyone. So you find what worked for the mean. In this case, it might be four week phases, mesocycles, macro cycles, peak deload, blah, 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 blah. And you extrapolate that and, and you say that it works ignoring the thousands of athletes that it may not work for because you've got this small group of hundreds that sort of validate what you're already putting out. So yeah, I think that that would fall into the post hoc fallacy. So I guess what I would say is with regard to if, if it, that is the case, because again, 
so much of what happened in the Soviet Union, unless you're actually there as like in law and cut in it's like, you know, there's a whole lot of stuff of like what really happened. And <laughs> and until the day I learn Russian, I can read some legitimate people's things in Russia, I probably will, you know, never know. Um, but I guess the thing is so if, if we're to believe that report that he analyzed the, the training logs. Uh, and what I might, you know, might have the knives out me from the quant science crew, the quantitative science crew here. But uh, when you do that, you have zero contextualization. So you have no, you know what they did by the numbers, but you have no idea why they did what they did. And so that means you have half. And in fact, I think you have the half that is probably more dangerous because then you can interpret it and read into it and determine why they did what they want for a million reasons. And I think what's really important would have been for, if you didn't do this, for Matt Vieux to be like, okay, cool, here are the training logs, sit down with, which is probably not going to happen because there's only so many coaches, but sit down with the coach and ask them to talk them through. Okay, so first of all, this is what happened. But more importantly, aside from why you might have done what you did, is this what you set out to do at the very beginning? Mm -hmm. Because that's another question. You saw the end point, but is the end point what the coach had? And I was like, oh, God, no. You see where he did that like massive dive? Like, I, I thought he was going to peak there. Like, I thought he was legitimately going to peak. And that's why we changed the training load up, because he didn't peak. And so we need to give him a deload or whatever. And so that's what I mean. You know, so how many times does stuff like that happen? I mean, I guess... All you have to think of is anybody's own coaching or training experience to realize that very rarely does the training go exactly as planned. And so you need to know what was planned, what was the proposed plan and what actually happened and ask why, when there were differences, why did they happen? And also, why did you propose the plan in that first instance? No, I mean, I think that's a, the person that comes to mind when you say that, and again, I go back to the emergent stuff, but is is Mike Tashir with powerlifting? Mm -hmm. The guy, yeah. you know, the guy who's credited with bringing RPE to yeah. to weightlifting. I think we may have talked about him when you came on the first time, but because he'll do that, and he can he can show you an athlete's training plan and show you how many exposures it took for them to sort of peak and then fall off. And he he will he will arrive at that endpoint, but he'll know because of the way he set up training, like this particular athlete needs more volume before a competition. This particular athlete needs more intensity, yada, yada, yada. So it, there's definitely a conversation there about the context. And and one of the questions I wanted to ask you, and it might be beyond the scope of, of the paper, but I'm curious as to your thoughts to it, is there, or did you notice at all a correlation between age and or coaching experience and then kind of the likelihood of a deviation from periodization. And I, I say that because I think for all of us, and I know you and I have touched on it, like right out of school or right out of a certification, you, you're you very pro periodization. You're very pro, you know, whatever, because that's the model that you've just kind of been tested on. But the more you work with athletes, the longer you work with athletes, the more you start to realize that maybe that might not actually be how it worked. Did any of that come out or did you even dive that deep when you were setting this up? I, mean, I think it's a really interesting question. Um, I think because of a couple of things, scientific reasons, for a few scientific reasons, I didn't due to like sample size, sampling methodology, all that kind of stuff, which would make it problematic for me to try and infer any of these things to a wider thing, but let look also even within the sample. But the one other thing I guess I would say is because of the periodization setup about, and what we've just talked about, about you say you use periodization, but maybe you don't use it like the textbook suggests, it could be that experienced coaches still say they use periodization until you ask those coaches exactly what they mean by periodization, then you don't know. Like, so for them, it could be like, yeah, yeah I use periodization, but then I start fishing around in their answers to the other questions. And actually, although they say they use periodization, which is fine, they like do glaringly different things than what like the textbook definitions suggest, you know, is a crucial part of periodization. I guess the bit I would definitely look at to try and figure that out would be the final section, which is like how coaches view, uh, I guess we call like changing the plan because a crucial part of periodization um, is it really shouldn't need to be changed unless like an athlete 
rolls their ankle or, or does something like that. It really shouldn't need to be. You could, because I'm not talking about what they call programming, which is the day to day fluctuations, but the periodization, as we just said, is really actually about getting key periods and aligning them. So, the stereotypical one in strength power sports is like you do four weeks of hypertrophy or whatever, then you do a strength block, then you do your power block before your event kind of situation. You really shouldn't be changing that order. In fact, that order should be 100% set in stone. Um, because obviously you want to finish on power because that's your event. You're not a bodybuilder, so you don't want to finish just, you know, getting jacked and have not done any power movements uh, in that kind of, but so, but a lot of these coaches were super open to change and they didn't view constantly changing the plan active thing, which really periodization takes a pretty dim view of because it shouldn't be necessary. You only do it when something happens that was out of your control. As one of the questions phrased, so one of the statements, sorry, was over the course of the training period, training targets should remain fixed. Now that didn't say about anything about specific, like, you know, how much you squat or whatever. That's just like whatever your goal, whatever the target is, which is, should be physiological according to periodization, that should be primarily fixed. They didn't do that. So that would be the bit I would look into just going back about to the experience bit that you're asking with regards to coaches and experience. I would get my gut instinct would be that I think it'd be very difficult to have spent any time in the field and to stick to that unless, and there are some caveats, if you are working with 40 athletes, I would be like, you probably need to do periodization because the chances that you can really do anything else while having to deal with 40 people at the same time is probably really difficult. Mm -hmm. In fact, some might say that that's exactly why periodization was created because, you know, the Soviet Union had a massive wealth of people, of bodies, so to speak. And so you just punch everybody through the same thing. Stats being stats, over time, you will extract some amazing athletes just by, you know, that's how it works. On the the survivors. Exactly. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Unless you, unless you break them, you know, then <laughs> and they probably were some broken. You just get more. So Keiji, you set up like three different things I want to touch on here. Okay. I'll, I'll just like underline a couple of things you said, and then I'll mm-hmm. move into like an actual conversation separately. First, I will progress from a general statement you made to a specific statement from the paper. So that, that so is an intentional, that is an intentional periodization oh. pun that I just make sure you do it on the way there though. Just right. so, so you talked about how like, and this is like the overall concept of the survey that was like, ask mm-hmm. people whether they use periodization or not, and then ask them how they feel about fundamental concepts of periodization mm-hmm. to see if the two line up. And of the four statements reflecting specific periodization concepts that you questioned them on only one being that training proceeding from general to specific was agreed on by more than half of the periodization users, meaning the rest of the foundational concepts of periodization, less than half of self-described periodization users actually agreed with those foundational concepts in practice. I think that's fascinating. We've kind of hammered that one out. I just wanted the chance to proceed from general to specific in our conversation. (laughs) The next one I'm going to I'm going to go back to the Bampa textbook I pulled out for this conversation. I mentioned his statement at the beginning that planning, programming and periodization should not be used interchangeably. Mm-hmm. The the rest of that paragraph I think is kind of important cuz it explains which is which and how they fit together and which one periodization is. Um we might riff on this a little bit. I don't know, just laying it out cuz I don't know if I It's a little bit fuzzy definition of how he fits periodization <laughs> into planning and programming. But he says that planning is the process of arranging a training program into long and short phases in order to achieve training goals. Now, we'll just let that one sit because that sounds a lot like periodization. But programming, in contrast, is the act of filling this structure with content in the form of training modalities. So like the day-to-day, what exercises you do kind of stuff is the programming. I think most people would probably agree with that portion of it. Periodization then is basically, in his words, it incorporates planning and programming. It connects the two as it changes over time. And I'll quote him, thus we can define the periodization of the annual plan as the structure of the training process and the periodization of biomotor abilities as the plan's content. In other words, each time we divide the year into phases and establish a sequence of development for each biomotor ability, we form a periodized plan. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that really 
answers any of the questions. I kind of get where he's going of like the phases are the phases. They're just on a calendar. They're not like you're just chopping the calendar up into chunks. Mm -hmm. Then the programming is what you do on any specific day of picking exercises and picking intensities and things like that. And periodization is how you make sure the exercises you're picking as they align with the phases you put on the calendar turn into a logical flow of interdependent development plans. The, um, the sequentialization of biomotor abilities is carrying a lot of weight there. The assumption sure? that we can discreetly train one thing versus the other in isolation. I think that's one of and the core And he does things. have a giant flow chart on the next page. Of course he does. He wants to dive into it. But where, oh, where I kind of want to go, because I think we have dug into all of these, um, those are just kind of underlining points for take-home notes, right? What I wanted to do is, um, you cited some stuff with elite Brazilian soccer about a lot of them saying mm -hmm. that they don't use periodization. Um, there's also some stuff in there about how like non-periodization users cited congested and demanding training and competitive schedules faced by team sport athletes as a reason for not periodizing. And I thought it's interesting that you basically just a moment ago said periodization might be most suited to larger populations versus mm -hmm. it sounds like some practitioners are saying they have a harder time applying it to larger groups, not necessarily because it's a larger group, but because the nature of team sport means congested schedules, lots of competing stuff. Mm -hmm. And I think that's where we bring this conversation to a point where it's a little bit more relevant to tactical, because I think team sport and that congested training and competition mm -hmm. schedule probably, and like they have to drill a lot of things that aren't necessarily strength and conditioning and coordination between people and group tasks and stuff. All of that winds up, I think a lot better with the challenges faced in tactical environments where you have to train people on technical and tactical skills, as well as physical abilities. You have both, I mean, at least in resource units, you have strength conditioning coaches responsible for fitness stuff. And then you have leaders in uniform responsible for the rest. I think <laughs> all those things mean that the team sport environment might be a better corollary for tactical than mm -hmm. the individual sport environments where a lot of periodization gets talked about. I want to add something to that before we let you, let you go off on it. But my, I, I'm wondering how much of, because so much of team sports is skill-based. I mean, I'm thinking of soccer. It's a very skill-based sport. Whereas most of your most obsessive periodization users seem to be in the like weightlifting space mm -hmm. where, where it's less, I mean, it's still skill, but like the, the sport and the gym environment overlap a lot more than say a soccer player or a, and I just, I wonder if that has any play in that conversation as well. But anyway, I'll, I'll turn it back over to what Alex was asking. Uh, so just to first I'll say that um, with regards to what I was saying about um, large numbers of people, there's two instances where I think of that. Well, one in particular, sorry. Uh, and that is actually, uh, college sports in America. The reason I'm thinking of college sports in America in particular is if you are the lead S&C coach and let's say you're having to design the plans, you have a lot of people to deal with, potentially from a lot of different backgrounds. And the bit that periodization offers is it offers a very straight formulate way to deal with it. So like you just said, the, the problems faced by those football coaches is that they're trying to work with lots of people but they're also trying to tailor it to lots of people. If you've semi given up on the concept that you'll be able to tailor to lots of people, then periodization because of numbers, work hours, whatever. I mean, I can only imagine how understaffed a lot of those people are in comparison to potential elite football teams. You might just be like periodization is going to be better than doing nothing. Um, the other thing I would say is that I am in no way very knowledgeable about American sports. Um, so, and what I would counter that is like baseball, basketball, American football, and ice hockey. Um, but my understanding is at least from the collegiate system and possibly in the, no, I think it's the collegiate system in particular, is you have very discrete seasons that you have. So you have like your off season, your in season, you have your preseason games, some games in preseason don't count, et cetera. So it is already neatly packaged into periods to allow you to just overlay and if you look at some of the periodization textbooks come out of America, which are not even for those sports in particular, they talk about those things like seasons and that kind of stuff and where it is, which, you know, something like in my understanding from last time I checked could be more now like Premier League football in the UK, footballers play at least possibly some more sometimes 44 weeks of the year. Mm -hmm. 
So if you're playing 44 weeks, that's not much of an off season kind of time. Uh, and you're almost in season, like most All of the time. time. Uh, so listeners to this podcast can't see me holding up the essentials textbook to my camera but there is a chart in there we can't see it either because your lighting is not good hey relax <laughs> there, there is a chart in there like aligning periodization periods with phases of a season off season in season yeah whatever and that's kind of typical i think that's predominantly done because of an american market that oh, that's where the nsc is based obviously um with Actually, sorry, Alex. What exactly where was I meant to be talking about again? <laughs> I just went off on that one, and I was like, "Oh shit!" I knew. Oh, uh, we were this. we were just going into <laughs> like do team sport dynamics. Oh, right. Yeah. is implied, and does that tie into tactical? So I would say that team sport from those studies, and those are just the ones I can talk about because there aren't actually that many where they actually ask um, that kind of stuff. I wouldn't say that's just team sports. I think. Team sports is possibly the shining example because they do tend to have more congested things, but that's starting to spread to other sports as well. And that's part of the professionalization of sports is that, you know, you need to compete more often because that's how you bring in like money. That's how you justify yourself getting funded by national funding bodies. Or if you're not getting funded by national funding bodies, definitely for your sponsorship deals with like, you know, Puma or whoever, you you know, tends to sponsor your kit um, and give you money. But I know that's the case. Like we talk, mentioned weightlifting, I think, Drew. Mm-hmm. I would say I know a lot of weightlifting coaches that use approach quite close to what that um, was described in the team sports aspect. Uh, I definitely know the coaches I've worked with who coach me uh, use that. Um, three different like uh, coaches I've worked with, three Chinese, sorry, I should say, weightlifting coaches, the current group, definitely do that. And regarding what you said before, it would be very weird for me to go, uh, let's say a four week, because that's how people tend to four weeks, but like a four week training period without touching a 90% weight, which mm-hmm. would be like a test uh, at least once, probably more than once. But so going back to the specifics of that, I think that probably does fit your guy's situation in the tactical space a lot more, mainly because, and I think it's in that article as well, the one about the Brazilian football there's two others, one about Argentinian rugby and another one about Brazilian sprint and jump coaches. The bit of the definition they were given for the alternative to periodization was to keep people at a relatively high performance level throughout. And football, that's important because um, with that congested season, because you're not in a tournament structure, each game is assigned points. So there is no, oh, we can just lean back on this one because, you know, as soon as you start losing, then you start dropping in the leaderboards because it's not like a tournament structure, for example, where maybe you can sacrifice, you know, not go all out for a a game, whatever, and you'll still get through to the bit, to the, you know, the major bits of the tournament, Um, like the World Cup, where you see that happen sometimes once it actually starts. But I think for you guys, that makes a lot more sense. And I would say, but I, sorry, I just, I think it makes a lot more sense for everybody. Um, <laughs> it would be my take um, just because of the emergent nature of it. And I think it was in the Brazilian sprint and jump coaches paper, even for them, they would say like, you know, okay, so we set out and we know what our main competition is for the year. For example, it's, I don't know, let's say it's um, world championships um, and you have to qualify to get into that. And there's a X number of competitions. You're not going unless you, yeah, I wouldn't, I'm not saying, but you wouldn't be like, okay, I'm just going to do one competition before the world championships. And I know that on that competition, I will qualify. But if I don't qualify, that's it. End of the year, I just pack up my bags and I just go home and I give up on world championships. So like the description that was given, and I think I kind of used it in that paper is, you know, okay, so let's say you have three competitions where you have a chance to qualify and competition one comes around and you qualify for the biggest event of the year. Let's say it's world championships. Are you still going to train in the exact same way as if you're going to go to the other two competitions? Cause you might just be like, hell, I don't really need those next two competitions because I, you know, if we're going to use the concept of peaking, everybody knows that a competition takes out of you. So you have to recover a little bit after a competition. You just can't go straight back and train as if you hadn't done that competition there is psychological stress that goes along with it and a whole host of other things. 
So you might be like, post competition one, nailed it, got my qualification time. Let's redo the plan because now I'm not going to do competition two and three and I can like have more time preparing for the other one. Now you might also have planned that actually competition two is when we'll get that time. You know, in my head, comp two will get it and then we'll go. Comp two happens, you have a shit day, you don't get it. Well, now I probably need to change the plan because I'm probably going to have to compete in that third competition that I wasn't going to do uh, if I want to qualify to go to world championships. So, I mean, automatically you have to make those decisions. I don't know why you would continue training to do comps that you don't necessarily need to do if you if you if there's no incentive to do them. Mm-hmm. When you could just be like, actually, you know, I'll just change things up, reevaluate based on a new scenario, which I didn't necessarily expect. Mm-hmm. So we have officially cracked the hour mark, and I know Drew's going to bring us to a close soon, but I do want to bring up a paper that I end up citing in conversation all the time. I've pointed a ton of people towards it. It is not an academic paper and it is very tactical specific, Mm -hmm. Um, but it's, it's by then major Matt Clark. Uh, It's been three years. I don't know if he's gotten a promotion yet. Um, Special forces officer. And it's titled the army has a physical fitness problem. Part one, eight myths that we can combat readiness. Um, I will link this in the show notes for any listeners, but coming back to this periodization conversation and peaking stuff and all that and tying it to a tactical specific population he points out and i think i've seen this happen plenty of times where i've been in units that have gone through a full training cycle you the army is balancing physical readiness and tactical readiness tactical readiness being your ability to perform the technical components of your job right and to work on collective tactical readiness you have to compromise physical fitness you have to take people to the field you're going to compromise sleep. You're going to compromise nutrition. They're not going to be in the gym, all those kinds of things. And you compromise it more and more the farther into the training cycle you get. And then at the culmination of the training cycle where you reach peak tactical readiness, you do things like a three-week long brigade field training exercise or a month plus long combat training center rotation, which are the things that compromise physical readiness the most. Mm-hmm. And he... He has a takeaway at the end of that section of the article of with our current approach to the combination of tactical training and physical training, the result is that we deploy people at their lowest state of physical readiness, not their highest or anywhere in between. We actually compromise it the most before the end. So I think I've seen I've seen lots of presentations on how we're supposed to take the like off-season, pre-season, in-season, post-season model and apply it to a tactical world. And I think we we have definitely played ourselves on that one because we end up doing the opposite of that because of the constraints of how tactical is just the mm-hmm. nature of the schedule outside of physical training not not tons to discuss there necessarily but i'd encourage people who are interested in this topic to go check out that article it makes me think of two things the first is that um because we've mentioned it before i think the last time um general adaptation syndrome by Hans Selye. Nobody's seen it. It's very recognizable by a very distinct curve, which is you start exposing a human in this case, I guess, to a stimulus. A stimulus can be anything. In this case, we're going to call it training. And initially, there's like a bit of a shoot up in the curve. And then the curve starts to go all the way down. You then go down below baseline. And then at some point, you kind of shoot back up. And you end up in a better state than you were at the beginning. Um, it's also a similar thing in what they call super compensation, which is that you know it goes down, performance goes down, and then you start to like recover, blah blah, blah all that kind of stuff, adapt to the stimulus, etc. And then you kind of go up and your performance is a better level, which kind of just sounds like in what I was always told in gym terminology, which is we're just gonna dig you into a hole. <laughs> with volume and then intensity and then closer to the competition we're just going to start pulling that back and then you're going to freshen up and then you're going to be better than you were before which sounds like at the time i was like cool okay <laughs> um, but like when you think about it you're like why would i do that and since that's the model that's kind of used uh, and that kind of underpins periodization to a certain extent as well that sounds hella crazy uh for people in a tactical space because 
hope you don't have to do anything that requires you to do your tactical stuff in the middle of your hole when you're feeling like crap you're like probably not getting sleep because you're not recovering you know and you don't want to do anything really uh that sounds like a perfect model to project onto people in the armed forces we're the other peaking, thing bro we're peaking exactly we're <laughs> peaking because we know exactly when we're going to have to go into combat <laughs> you better not ask me to fight on my deload week yeah. that's all I just, i'm saying i did legs yesterday i can't exactly i, can't, I, I so. can't do anything i can't <laughs> run you know don't ask me to do that the other thing is that looking at looking around just because of what we asked about what you did at the beginning talked about pre-periodization an area that i would think would be kind of interesting to look at because we have to, first of all, understand strength training, and I use that loosely, so what we would call strength training. Strength training is very old. It's not something that was just started, you know, in Greece, even at the ancient Olympics, let alone the modern Olympics. Um, people have done it all around the world at various times. More importantly, lots of people who were, quote unquote, what we might call warriors, people in the army, et cetera, et cetera, have done that. So I would have thought it'd be like, hmm, rather than look at sports, which kind of isn't the same, why don't we look at people and what they did in martial arts around the world, especially when martial arts were traditionally created by people who were actually going to go to war? And I don't know. I'm just, you know, I'm not great on history, but my understanding is in the past, we definitely did go to war a lot more than we currently go to war. I mean, I know, for example, definitely... For people who are into martial arts, uh, Okinawan karate traditionally had resistance training and they had traditional tools that were made of like some that look like barbells, like actually things of wood with stone plates attached to the end. The Chinese had the same thing. I would be really surprised if most of East Asia didn't. They in, uh, I guess, what was Mesopotamia, now the Middle East, they definitely have that. That's where you get things like um, they had a version of like Indian club training. Uh, what's modern day Iran had a very big um, lifting culture uh, that was done by their quote unquote warrior type class people in the military. So I would just be really interested in looking at what they're doing because they probably face some of the same problems that you guys would do and they would need to be ready to go pretty much probably at a drop of a hat into a military situation and they train to fight on a day-to-day -day basis as well. I'm thinking of um, geopolitically at the moment, this might be a sensitive reference, but we had a guy on who was in the Israeli defense force mm -hmm. and the reserves. And, and he mentioned that just by nature of the fact that they're kind of always postured for exactly what they're dealing with right now. They, they do. It, it's an interesting mindset shift when when you you are kind of always having to be on the ready because at any given point you might have to be called into action but i, I want to ask this question to to generate a little bit of conversation as we work towards a close here mm -hmm. we've now had a couple of episodes on periodization and we could call them critiques on periodization um and, and inevitably the same kind of criticism comes back at us, which is, you know, well, what's the alternative? It's if you're not planning things, you're just totally random, yada, yada, yada. You guys are idiots. You guys are assholes. Oh, wow. It's, <laughs> it's mostly towards Alex. Sorry for you guys. Uh, it's I a, usually feel most of that feedback. It's fine. <laughs> he gets, I'm just, I post baking pictures. <laughs> but I want to ask just kind of from your, your perspective, your opinion on this. So for, for coaches that do favor a more fluid kind of planning approach versus this rigid static periodization approach, how do you safeguard against randomness? How do you safeguard against that critique that we always get, which is that, well, if you're not doing phases and mesos and macros, then you're just random. What do, what do you say to that? A really good question, actually. Thanks, man. Thanks. <laughs> I mean, I have seen ran. I mean, before I ever got really into into sports, sports science, uh, I was a personal trainer. So I have seen random because there was a period in my personal training career where I have no idea where this fad came from. But people would choose exercises, etc., for the day based on a specialized 
deck of cards. Oh yeah. You oh, would yeah. shuffle the cards and draw. Now that is really loves that. much closer to random than <laughs> okay, sorry. Oh well, okay. Uh that's much closer to random than anything I've seen then being done with an athlete. Uh clearly I might be misspeaking when I say that about the military. <laughs> uh that that's random. That that that's random. That's like, well, probably not random because poker at all isn't random, but it's it's close. It, it's a lot closer. I don't think anybody would actually really be doing anything random because as long as you're thinking about what you're doing and you're making, and this is why I had an issue with that, I think a quote that Alex pulled out later where, where they used the word logic mm -hmm. um, because logic, I don't, I have deep problems with how they use logic when it comes to periodization. Logic in their worldview, yes, but logic period, that's a problem. Um, so as long as you're thinking about what you're doing and, you know, you've assessed the athlete for whatever time span you're talking about, whether it's the day, the week, however long you've plotted out last, you've taken in as much information that you have available to you that you think is useful to help, you know, um, make your decisions and that you're making your decisions based on that, then I don't think it's random. People might think that it looks random. And I guess something I learned as a personal trainer and as a coach is I think the most important thing is, is if somebody can come up to you and ask you why are they doing that and you can explain, then I don't think what you're doing is random. It's actually thought through. And I think that's the main thing. If somebody comes up and asks you why you're doing that and you can give like a coherent answer um, that you know has some kind of rational explanation, then I think that's sweet. Because I don't really think that, you know, anybody had there. I don't think there's an asingular answer. And I think possibly on, on a way to explain that is there's a concept called uh, equifinality, which is that, you know, you can all do the same thing and it will lead to different points. But at the same time, there's a thing called multifinality, which is that uh, you can all start in different places. Uh, so do different plans and still end up at the same place as a develop this is a, from developmental psychology so you can all end up in theory getting the same results if you clone the person by doing different plans there is not one that is going to be the truth the plan for that person or a group of people what a uh what a flex to end it with a little bit of a philosophical reference <laughs> I, I uh i appreciate that i'm picturing the ramps with the marbles and how they all end up at the same speed even if they drop at different steepnesses and stuff hey he's, you got out <laughs> before we let you go i know that yeah. there's, a, there's a third there's a third paper coming out right well hopefully i mean let's touch what i mean you know it has to be accepted reviews well that's what you told us when we had you on the first time about the second one and, and here we yeah are. but i mean serious like at that point it hadn't been actually accepted so <laughs> Fair was enough. still in the review process. So th there's proposed, let's put it like that. There's a third proposed paper that uh, is in a part of the review process. I'll leave it at that. Fair enough. But yeah, and that is, I guess, for me at least, that will kind of link the first two together in the fact that it, what it discusses underpins all of it. Um, yeah. Well, there's your there's the Netflix teaser for the impending uh, <laughs> third third. Season. I clearly just said that so that you would get me back on. <laughs> <laughs> no, we're we're already gonna book it. So just give us give us a date and we'll have you back on. But no, seriously, thank you for coming on again. No problem. I, thank you guys. We uh we love having you on, and we'll Alex share with him some of the crit the criticism that you get from uh from this conversation. All right, I will certainly share it. I do want to ask him before he goes, just to make sure I'm tracking right. The third part is about ability to predict training outcomes. That's what we're going for in the third part. Don't spoil it, man. Yes. Okay. It's not that spoiled because it's literally in the first two papers in the methods. <laughs> I was going to say, if anybody reads the method, the <laughs> proposed bit is there, but I don't want to say that it's happening because the review pro process is a fickle mistress and she can Fair. easily just be like, rejected and you're like well i <laughs> guess that's not happening that's one of those soviet guys will be on there be like screw this dude he's not publishing any more oh, stuff <laughs> i have slated a few of them so <laughs> oh man awesome. all right well, well thanks again no problem thank you guys it's always really really good to talk to you guys um it definitely gives me some new things to think about um and hopefully next time just so you know next time if there is next time 
I will actually try and think and do a bit more research on the tactical space so that I can actually think better about how it might actually translate um, because Ooh. I think it's actually, it has its own problems, I guess, as many things do. But I think thinking about it from a sports context, A, doesn't do the problems a service. It, it does them a disservice. And I think that, I think we probably discussed this in the last episode, trying to just like take sports science and be like, yeah, these dudes are just athletes. I mean, like maybe they can perform like athletes, but they face very unique things that almost no athlete is ever going to face, like the threat of under fire, which I don't think so far, as far as I understand it, <laughs> any athlete has faced while competing. Well, stay tuned. Looking forward to it. Hey, Alex, let's cover our ass real quick. Oh, great idea, Drew. All right, guys. The views and opinions expressed in this program are those of the speakers and do not necessarily reflect the views or positions of any entities they represent. Thanks for tuning into this week's episode. Before you go, please rate and review the pod on the listening platform of your choice. You can also visit us on our website at www.mopsinmos.com. That's mops, the letter in, mos.com. You can check out the library of podcast episodes our latest blog entries, any helpful resources, and also sign up for our newsletter. Drew nailed it. Just to underline a couple of things, the podcast entries have in-depth show notes on the website. So if you missed anything or you want to read any of the research we talk about, it is all there. You can, at the bottom of the website, sign up with your email and receive future updates from us. The blog posts go a little bit more in depth and kind of written form on a couple of topics we get questions about all the time. But most importantly, I just want to ask all you guys, our best way the word gets out is absolutely word of mouth. So tell your friends, tell the people you work with, anybody you think would find it useful. Thanks for spreading the word. If you have any questions or comments, feel free to shoot us an email at either Drew or Alex at mopsandmos.com. Or there's a contact form on the website. Thank you.